So I, I actually um, came from being a neurologist, but I didn't get to be neur a neurologist uh, at the very beginning of my life. I began to be interested in sleep and circadian rhythms as a graduate student when I got my PhD at Northwestern. And at that time, we were interested in the timing of physiological processes. I had no idea at that time, this is 19, late 1970s, that, that, that there would be a field, a clinical field of sleep medicine. So when you think about it, you see all these sleep centers all across the city now, but it really is relatively new. It's really since that, you know, in, in the last maybe 30 or so years, and now it's really you know, blossomed into this very large field. What I'm gonna do today is to give you a bit of an overview of why, if you, if you don't learn a thing from this whole talk and if you fall asleep, you at least can remember, I need to go home and I need to not just myself, but I need to tell my friends, I need to tell my children, I need to tell my grandmother to prioritize their sleep. That sleep is essential for good health. It is like food, it is like water, it is like exercise. And let me show you a little bit of the science behind that and the evidence for that. This is a very diverse uh, group of people from young to older adults. So I'm gonna try to make it interesting, hopefully for all of you, they can take a little bit of that. So you see the, the, the earth rotating around the sun. This is the biggest, most important kind of physical change that occurs in our day and night, right? And to be able for whether whether it's a plant or whether it's even a bacteria or complex humans like us, we need to have our activity, our feeding cycles, when we get energy, our rest cycles, all to be aligned with this rotation of the earth around the sun. But what what have we done? What have we done? We got lights. 24-7 now. We have a 24-7 society. We have, you know, when we call, we can call anybody at any time of the night. If you want to get help from American Airlines, guess who? Somebody in India is answering your call, right? So at any time of the day. So this, this has really, our biology wasn't meant to be like this, but yet we are living in the society and therefore the increase in sleep disorders. So from the very beginning, we have these circadian rhythms. These are molecular rhythms, I will show you. And the word circa dia comes from approximately 24 hours. These are rhythms that are generated inside your body, inside all your cells. And I don't know whether I have another slide after this. And one of the most prominent of these circadian rhythms is the sleep and wake cycle. You sleep wake with a regular cycle that approximates 24 hours. And it's also hugely important for the regulation of fuel and metabolism. So you could say you're active during the day because you're trying to get fuel, you're trying to get energy source, I mean, very simplistically. And then you need to rest at night. You need to rest when the sun is down at night to be able to, re to, to, to rest and rejuvenate and restore some of the functions that have been used. It's like a car. If you're a car, you're using fuel. Every time you have fuel that you're using, you generate what? Toxic substances. You have side products of that. And that happens in your body as well. So sleep is really, really important in being able to get rid of some of those. And you can see securely, you know, we all want to be like sleeping like babies, right? They look great. You can just move them around in the middle of the night and then go, they, they move around a little bit and then go right back to sleep. And then we have, you know, healthy uh, young people who are you know, going outside, getting sunlight and exercising. Then we have these teenagers here who are laid up at night with blue light facing their eyes with iPhones, iPads. This is creating, in some, to some extent, sleeplessness in our society, especially in these young kids, right? Where everything is important. Their brain is developing, their muscles are developing, and of course, uh, their brains are, are, are developing. And then we can think about sleep changes as you get older, where sleep becomes more fragmented. 
uh, early morning awakenings. It's hard if somebody were to wake you up in the middle of the night for you to get back to sleep like this baby because your deep sleep goes down as you get older. By the time you're about 85 or 80 so, you have very little deep sleep. Babies and young adults, they have somewhere between 20 to 30% of the night in this very, very deep stage. And deep sleep is the most restorative part of sleep. There are two processes that regulate when you sleep, how much you sleep, and how well you sleep. Conceivably, there is this process that we scientifically call it the homeostatic process. So that is a neurotransmitter or substance that builds up in your brain, in your neurons, from the time that you woke up this morning. It's going up. It's going up. And it goes up about 16 hours of wakefulness. Remember, you're burning fuel, right? 16 hours of wakefulness. You reach its maximum, and you have to be, go to sleep. You're very tired. You're very sleepy. When you sleep, the substrate in your brain goes away, goes away, goes down. All right? How many of you drink coffee or take caffeinated beverages? A lot of you, right? Well, caffeine is an antagonist to this buildup of this molecule. And this molecule or this neurotransmitter is called adenosine. So caffeine is an adenosine receptor antagonist. See, now you know when every time you're drinking coffee, you are decreasing the reception of this increase in this uh, adenosine. But if that was the only thing that kept you sleeping and, and, and waking, then we would actually, you can see the pressure is building up fairly high here. We would be like cats or maybe better Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, he was certainly better to be Leonardo than a cat, I suppose. But they have very bad circadian rhythms because what, they, what the cat does, catnaps, anybody have cats? The word catnap comes from the fact that they nap every couple hours, right? They can catnap. And so we would, without this other process, we'd be catnapping. So the other important one is called the circadian clock, and this is located in your brain as well. And what the circadian clock does is that it produces in your brain an alerting signal. It counteracts the sleep signal by making you stay awake. The only reason that you are actually awake right now, especially right now, is because the circadian clock system is producing an alerting signal to you. So even if you stayed up all night, this is the time that you will be less sleepy. Actually, an hour from now, you will be the, the, the less sleepy. So it is what's allowing us to stay awake all day, despite the increase in the sleep need. And then when the signal for wakefulness goes down in the brain, it allows us to get that beautiful seven to eight hours or nine hours of sleep that is relatively uninterrupted. So it's really this balance between these two systems. And then around that time, when the signal goes down, melatonin, how many of you take melatonin or know about melatonin? Melatonin gets produced by your own pineal gland in your brain, and this is another signal. It is darkness in your brain. It is dark. It is the body's internal dark signal. It says time to sleep, time to rest. So it is really this, in, this interaction. I told you already about caffeine. Every physiological process that you can think of has a 24-hour rhythm, or what we call a circadian rhythm. Your deepest sleep occurs around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. If you are going to bed around before midnight, your blood pressure goes up before you actually wake up. Your heart rate goes up before you actually wake up. Because imagine if, you, if your blood pressure was still low before you actually stood up you may actually pass out. So this whole system is preparing you for wake activities and also sleep activities. Strokes occur and heart attacks occur in these early morning hours, around 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, more so because your blood platelets are stickier. There's your, your, your ability to coagulate is actually higher during these periods of time. And you can kind of go around a lot 
And the other thing is you look at performance, mood also changes across the day. One of the things that I do is, um, because I'm a circadian biologist, I, you know, I look at my coworkers or more likely my superiors and I think, what kind of chronotype are they? Are they morning types or are they evening types? Because you know what? You can use that to get stuff from them. Because if they're morning types, by three o'clock, you know, they're pretty tired. You know, they go like, okay, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm sleepy, right? And if they're really late types like me, then we'll go to bed until like one or two or later, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, I'm having my coffee, I'm going like, okay, fine, I don't wanna talk about it, sure, you can have it. So, so there is some, some value to this. So all of that is, is changing. And of course, sleep and wake is your most prominent. These are just other things to show. Look at your blood pressure. This is your systolic blood pressure. In this little yellow part is when you actually are sleeping, okay? So this is across 24 hours. Look what happens to your blood pressure when you sleep. It goes down. And we know that when the blood pressure, when you sleep, doesn't go down, for example, before sleep apnea, it is a risk factor for heart disease. So it's what we call the nocturnal dipping of blood pressure. Your insulin, you know, what's controlling your blood sugar, has this beautiful circadian rhythm. You see it's very low here at night. Leptin levels is, leptin is a hormone that regulates appetite. So when you don't sleep, your leptin level goes down, you get hungry. You need to eat more during the day, and you also need to eat more during the night. This is how sleep deprivation can lead to perhaps uh, obesity. Somebody was asking me this uh, as well. But then you can look at things like memory, performance, alertness, they all follow this day-night rhythm. So really, it, 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 it really, the sleep and, and these circadian rhythms are highly regulatory. I'm gonna kind of skip this a little bit. So what's so cool about this? Why are we doing, what is the science about this? So this is 1998, a uh, couple years after I started um, in medicine. This was the cover of the journal Science, and this is a major journal in the world, okay? This is like, if you're a researcher, you wanna be published you know, in the journal Science, and your dean gives you lots of brownie points for doing that. So it says, this was a remarkable year for clocks. 19th century philosophers proposed the guy was a clockmaker, not that I'm proposing that that's true, was who created the world and let it run like I, like I was showing you. In 1998, a volley of rapid fire discoveries revealed the stunning universality of clock workings across a tree of life from bacteria to humans they oscillate in every tissue, these molecules, this, this, this genetics, oscillates in every tissue to keep internal and external, internal timing. This major, why 1997? Because in 19, 1998, 1997, at Northwestern University, it was the discovery of the first mammalian clock gene, and that set up in motion this big, you know, uh, every, a lot of things that we know, to the point that in 2017, the Nobel Prize for medicine and physiology went to the discovery of these circadian clock genes. So this is quite, quite fantastic, I think, when you think about it. I'm not showing you the genes, but this is the genetic makeup. It's very simple. This, this, this gene was discovered at North, uh, I mean, the clock was discovered at Northwestern. In the nucleus, they get together, they start transcribing proteins. These proteins go into the cytoplasm and then they re-enter. So how quickly these proteins get made, how quickly they get back into the nucleus determines whether you're gonna be an owl or a lark. Huh? Because the lark's clock runs faster than 24 hours. Right? And, the, and the really, and, 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 and the owl runs slower. And our ge how, whether you are, it's all genetic. Every cell in your body is ticking at that same rate, which is really, I, I think, marvelous when we think about science uh, in, in, in general. So now I said this clock is about 24 hours. It's not exactly the word circa dia, right? So how does it keep exactly 24 hours with the rotation of the earth, with the stuff that you have to do during the day so that you can wake up exactly at the same time? 
it needs to be regulated, it needs to be entrained by external factors. The most important of this is actually the light-dark cycle. This is why when you get light at the wrong time of the day, it messes things up for your sleep and for your clocks. And it is so important that from your retina, from your eye, to this clock in the brain, there's a direct pathway. And there's special photoreceptors. So you can be visually blind, but not circadian sleep blind. Because there's special photoreceptors that go directly, that are not image forming, but they give information to this clock that's ticking around. And this then regulates the timing and sends signals to all these clocks and all of these other tissues. But it isn't just light. We talked a little about melatonin. So when you take melatonin at night or during the day, it, it, it does also, like light, affects it. It's a dark signal. But what's been really, really important and I think innovative and cool is that we know that physical activity, when you exercise, how you exercise, can also provide timing information for this sleep-wake system. And this is the cool stuff, food. How much, not how much you eat, when you eat becomes a huge thing. We have, sh and I'll show you a little bit of data about that. So if you're interested, we actually have a study that's funded by the National Institute on, on, on Health and looking at the idea that metabolic aging, this kind of gaining in weight and all this kind of prediabetes may actually be related to this circadian clock system and we're using food and feeding as a way of adjusting this. So sleep and circadian rhythm isn't just for the brain. It is, of course, made in, in the brain. But it involves all tissues of the body. It is not just you know, the brain EEG that we record clinically, but it's, you can see this in every tissue and every organ. And therefore, it isn't just for sleep or timing. When you sleep, how much you sleep, how well you sleep has an impact on everything, on your inflammation, on your uh, metabolism, on everything that you can think about. So it, it's really, I think this is why the Nobel Prize in this year. So changes in your sleep and circadian rhythm affect your brain, neurological disorders, they're risk factors. Bad sleep is a risk factor for neurological disorders, even for cancer. The World Health Organization has classified shift work, which is one of the most common causes of circadian misalignment and also uh, sleep deprivation as a potential carcinogen, okay? Because the rate is much, much higher. Heart disease, uh, diabetes, which we talked about, you know, ulcers. So really, as you can see, the, the, the implication of sleep and circadian timing is very, very broad. So I'm going to ask you guys something. This is a test. It's called, are you sated? So satisfaction. Are you satisfied with your sleep? How many of you are satisfied with your sleep? Oh, is that why you're here? All right, a few of you. Do you stay awake all day without dozing? Are you asleep or trying to sleep between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m.? Uh -huh. Efficiency. Do you fall asleep in less than 30 minutes? The young ones do. See? And, and this gentleman in the back. Duration. Do you sleep between 6 and 8 hours per day? Okay. So you can tally these up, right? And there's this range. So good sleep health is in the 10 range. So you got to get a lot of these, right, to get to be to, to the 10, right? And then this is poor sleep health. So this is a, an idea. Uh, you know, it's just a fun task. But giving you an idea, the domains of what sleep is, it isn't just how many hours you get, but also when you're getting that sleep. So why is it important to society? 50 to 7 million Americans have a chronic sleep disorder. 30% nearly adults frequently uh, report insufficient sleep, which is about you know what I saw in this uh, audience here. And about 30% report falling asleep while driving in the last 30 days, according to the CDC. Pretty scary, eh? 
Sleep disorders and sleep disorders associated with many deleterious health effects, like I already mentioned. And if we care about the economy, the annual direct medical and indirect cost of lost productivity, et cetera, total in the hundreds of billions of dollars. This is the Institute of Medicine report. Anybody recognize this? Well, it occurred at 3 a.m. approximately, right? And not only did the CTA train crash into here, it really crashed. It went up into the escalator because the conductor fell asleep. And not only did she fall asleep, she fell asleep and fell on top of the lever, and it went right up to over here. Our soldiers, in the middle of the field, in the midst of danger, they still have to sleep. So this is such a huge, huge, I think, uh, imperative. And then insufficient sleep, like I said earlier, really has dramatic implications for everything. I'm not gonna talk about sleep disorders per se today because there's quite a few of them, there are about 80 of them. But this is another cause, in, in addition to us not prioritizing sleep, sleep and circadian disorders can also impact sleep deficiency. So why do we need to sleep? What do we know from the science now? It's important for alertness, performance, learning and memory in children and adults in general, especially older adults. It's important for mental, emotional health, physical health, and safety. This is one of the great um, pioneers in the, in the area of sleep research. His name is Alan Rechtschaffen from the University of Chicago. Upon his retirement, he was asked, Dr. Rechtschaffen, why did you spend all these years studying sleep? And he said, well, I was young and a bit foolish, and I thought, if sleep does not serve an absolute vital function, then it's the biggest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. Because when you sleep, you're vulnerable, right? So it's gotta be that it's got to be that uh, important. And now we're beginning to understand some of this. So this is a fun study done by Kathy Reed in my group. So this is what I call the Martini study. And so you took young people, healthy young people, and you just gave them martinis, okay? Or it's alcohol. Or the other group just got sleep deprived. So you can imagine who, which group wanted to be in which group. Uh, and you follow them. And so this, they, they actually got to be almost like legally drunk, right, from, from a blood alcohol level. And this is 21 hours of sleep deprivation. And they looked at performance. And look what you see. Performance, this is like touching a screen on, on, on the computerized testing and hours of wakefulness. So the longer you've been awake, the worse your performance, right? You can see that. Now, blood alcohol concentration and performance, do you see how they parallel each other? The more alcohol, this is just this 0.12 over here, which is legally drunk at 0.08, they parallel each other. So being awake for more than 16 hours, clearly closer to 20 hours, is equivalent in your performance and your danger level as being somebody who is legally drunk. And so there's not just mothers against drunk driving, there's mothers against drowsy driving uh, as well. No, there is. I mean, the, 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 these are types of things. And this is what I'm just going to show you. When you plot these two together, you can see that it's almost like driving under the influence. Your performance is just as bad as that. How many of you kind of think like, hey, you know, I'm going to sleep deprive myself or because I got stuff to do, but I'm going to recover that very quickly because I have the weekend to do that. Yeah? Yeah, okay. So this is a beautiful experiment. You don't have to know all the details of it. That's what they did. They restricted people for seven days of sleep. They did it for like here. That would be three hours a day only. That's pretty bad. And you can see their performance just goes bang right down across the days, day after day, get, getting worse. This is sleep restriction for only five hours. You, they're still getting five hours of sleep per day. And yet you can begin to see that their performance is not as good. And this is seven hours, and this is the nine hours of time in bed because these were young people. They let them sleep for 10 to 12 hours, and yet look how the, this group, these groups were never back 
to the control group. So it took more than three days to recover your sleep loss that you encountered over the course of a week. So this is a, uh, I, I love showing this because I have a lot of patients and people who say, I actually there was this driver that came. I go, sir, why are you here? He goes, I don't know. He goes, they, they say I'm sleepy. I go, well, you're driving a truck. Are you sleepy? No, 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 not at all. I go, somebody saw you fall asleep at the wheel. He goes, no, I was just resting my eyes. So here is how we think, if you were asked somebody who's been sleep deprived over the course of time, and you say, how alert are you? How alert are you subjectively? Do you see how beautiful it is? They go, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. The longer they're actually awake, they even feel better. They're even more fine. They're even more alert, they think, right? But if you look at their brain wave, their EEG, to actually see whether their brain is actually awake or not, look at that. There's no coin, it doesn't relate to each other. So how you think you're performing after sleep deprivation and how you actually are performing is quite different. So this is the danger of it, is that we kind of get used to that. Sleep is really important for memory consolidation. Let me show you some activity on that. So here, I'm gonna just show you, so where is that? I'm going to show you this. So here is a study done at Northwestern where they did a napping. This is just a napping study where they did a 90-minute nap and a post-nap test. What they did was made people remember certain types of words, and they paired it with a sound. Let's say cat, meow, or cat, dung. Those are tones. They weren't even like sounds of cat. They were just tones played. And they learned that during the day. And then they were asked to perform, to take the test, their memory test, before the nap and then after the nap. And you can see that after the nap, they remembered more. And they remembered more. Not only did they remember more words, because we already knew that, but they remember more, even more, if you just play that tone while they were sleeping. So sleep can actually reactivate memories, okay? It can reactivate memories. So not only do you get better with sleep, but also your, your memory is being replayed during sleep, which I think is pretty cool. And it's also associated with that deep sleep. The more deep sleep you have, the better this memory formation. And this is true whether you're a basketball player, so this is just motor skills, you know, like how do you, you know, dribbling a ball or, or doing finger tapping, even motor skills get better after you sleep. Improves dramatic, significantly after you sleep. Well, why that may be? So how many of you think that the garbage truck comes into your brain when you're sleeping? That sounds really weird, right? Well, let me show you. This is one of the great pieces of science in the last couple years to show why sleep is so important for your brain. So the brain, this is a beautiful, again, that beautiful journal science. This is one of the major journals uh, in, in, in all of science. And the cover of this journal says, um, and this is actually from the New York Times, that you can see these guys sweeping your brain during sleep, right? So there's garbage removal in the brain when you sleep. When you sleep, this is a video of your spinal fluid flowing. This is your brain. This is not the most handsome looking person, but look at this brain there. And there's the spinal fluid. Do you see that water being pumped around? That helps to flush out, like the toilet flush, that helps flush out these toxic activities. The fact that I'm talking to you, I'm generating toxic activity. I'm generating A beta amyloid, which is what is part of what uh, for Alzheimer's disease. This is what accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. And we know that during sleep, the, the cells, this fluid spot opens up and allows these large toxic molecules to be flushed out. So it is really important to sleep because sleep may actually help decrease the risk. Perhaps, I don't have that proof yet, but if you take it one more step to decrease um, 
maybe even dementia, for example, some of the neurodegenerative disorders that happen as we get older. This is just showing the same thing over again. So we can think about what are we afraid of when we get older? We're afraid of neurodegeneration. We're afraid of our mind because we can, we, we, you know, we are, we, we've controlled our heart disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and we believe that the neurotoxins are doing this, but also if you disrupt your sleep, it can also lead and perhaps increase the risk for these age-related disorders that we are very quite concerned about. And I'm just gonna show you that this is the paradigm shift based on the science. I used to think that if you had dementia, if you had Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, your brain is neuro, it's degenerating, right? So it's not, or, or for that matter, you know, aging. And that leads to disruptions in sleep. This is why 50% of older adults have sleep problems. And then that leads to poor cognition. But the science now shows a paradigm shift that if you have circadian and sleep disturbances, even early in life, especially in midlife, it increases the risk for neurodegeneration and therefore perhaps cognition. So improving sleep, like exercise, is one of the ways that, per, that you can actually try to stave off the bad stuff that may occur. So of course, sleep is not just for the brain. I wrote this for, for the US War on Report. Sleep is also for your body. Sleep helps improve your glucose control, decreases your inflammatory uh, reactions, and it also improves your appetite regulation. I'm gonna show you this. Four hours in bed, 12 hours in bed. Look what happens to your heart rate variability. This is not good. This shows, this is a sign somebody with a bad heart. This is good. You can see that sleep impact your heart rate. How many of you had the flu shot? Some of you, okay, great. Did you get a good night's sleep after your flu shot or before your flu shot? Well, think about that next year. Think about that next year because this is a study, they sleep deprived 11 people, and then in the orange, uh, in the yellow were the non-sleep deprived people. They all got a flu shot. This is 10 days after the flu shot. They're looking at the antibody titer, right? Because you're supposed to build up the antibody. Those who were, not, who were sleep deprived were not protected yet. Whereas those who were allowed to sleep, who were not sleep deprived, were protected in that first week. So it affects your immune uh, function as well. There's a U-shaped curve. If you sleep less than six hours on average, I'm not saying this is true for everybody. There are differences. This is big population-based studies. You can see increases your risk for hypertension, obesity, diabetes, stroke, whatever you want. It's a lot of different bad stuff, right? A lot of adverse uh, outcomes. But also, look over here on this other side. If you're sleeping more than nine hours, that's not unless you're a child or an adolescent or a young adult. But if you are like 50 years old or 60 years old and you're sleeping more than nine hours, that also increases the risk. And that may be indicative of maybe comorbid or coexisting illnesses that may be going on. So this is for the young, for the young girls uh, out there. Uh, this is what you guys look like sometimes, right? So we found that if you eat late after 8 p.m., Right? You also eat more fast foods. Late eaters eat more fast foods. They eat less fruits and vegetables. Imagine, how many of you have been up like two or three in the morning in your life? Yeah. And where are you going? God, I wish I had a salad. Nah. Yeah. So you see what's happening with shift work? Do you see what's happening with our population staying up late at night? And so this was a study that we did and can see New York Times. We got lots of things about late night eating linked to weight gain, eating at irregular hours, and what we found was that indeed they had higher, people who ate late had higher BMIs. Partially it's because we get light at night, and that is a problem for our circadian system. Only 120 years ago was there electric lighting. So it's very recent in our biology, so we weren't quite ready. Now we have LED lighting, and we can change all the colors of that. There's no night on Earth. There's light everywhere. It doesn't matter what hemisphere you are on. In the industrialized countries, we have light. And that is what we call, you know, we talk about noise pollution. We should think about light pollution. 
uh, as well. And in the city of Chicago, we are putting blue, bright LED lights uh, on the streets because it is a safety issue and it is important, but we should also be thinking about the health and this is how much light there will be in Europe, you know, just in, t in, in a few years compared to what it was 20 years ago. We found that those individuals who did not get enough light in the morning, in the early until about noontime, they were more likely to be overweight and obese. So that exposure to light, exposure to exercise is quite important. So I'm going to summarize this by saying that there are many sleep disorders like insomnia, sleep apnea, narcolepsy. There are also behavioral lifestyle issues that we just talked about that can rob us of our sleep and the quality of our sleep. Of course, there's also genetic vulnerability. There, you may be predisposed to that. And when you have an alteration in your sleep and circadian rhythms, it increases inflammation, alters metabolism, decreases you, your neurons from being able to work well in your brain for memory and performance. And that is why it's linked not just to performance, but it's linked to these health outcomes like learning, memory, metabolic, neurological disorders. But what's I think really important of what we know is that it's a bi-directional relationship. If you don't, if you're ill, you're more likely not to sleep well. If you don't sleep well, you may be more likely to get ill. So it's really what, what I call this bi-directional relationship. And I try to explain that we need to attack it from, of course, uh, both ends. So basic advice for healthy sleep, maintain a regular sleep-wake schedule. Allow seven to eight hours of night for sleep. This is true across all ages. And in younger people, even more. Exercise daily, but not within three hours of sleep. Appropriately time light and feeding. Don't eat late at night with all the lights on, right? And, uh, and also remember, getting that morning light is quite important, just like you're getting here in this morning light. And finally, for those of us who are a little bit older, and maybe for those of you who are young, this has a lot to do with healthy and successful aging. So I, I say, for me, I say once I realize that we are eligible for senior discounts, healthy aging is what we hope for. And the message here is good clock, stay in rhythm, good sleep, and that translates into good health. And finally, leave you with this. Are you worried about growing old? Don't lose sleep over it because aging is the only way to lead a long life, right? And it's all in your brain because look at this uh, young lady uh, over here. So thank you very much for your attention.